The choices you make and specifically the way you choose to see God matters. How you choose to interpret the circumstances of your life matters because what you choose to believe about Him is who you'll show others that He is. Will you choose to see Him through the eyes of fear and doubt or through the understanding of a God who not only loves us, but is love? Join me today as we learn to see Him rightly, as we learn to choose love. Hi there, I'm back. Oh, and with Bonnie, she picks her head up here. Hi, Bonnie. Oh, and there's radio too. <laughs> hey, you guys. So obviously I'm not in the studio for Choose Love today. Um, I'm in our guest bedroom, actually. And I'm using my iPad instead of our good camera. Um, Johnny's actually in the studio doing Elijah streams right now. So I keep waiting for the ideal time to film my next Choose Love, and it hasn't come. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do it with what I have and um, take advantage of this window of time that I have to, to just share with you again from my heart, as always. I was gone the last couple of weeks. Um, I was gone actually one week to the beach. It was my birthday and just had a time that I really needed um, just to be refreshed and connect with myself. Do you ever feel like you just don't even know what your own heart is thinking or feeling because you're so busy and um, you know maybe just in survival mode or whatever the challenges are for you? And for me, I, um, as you know, maybe you missed my last episode, just in case my um, parents have a big life change that has connected to a big life change for us. Um, they were on their way here to visit us to begin looking for a home to live in our neighborhood, actually, in Nashville. And um, they got in a horrible car accident. And my mom broke um, both of her hips and had hip surgery two different surgeries and basically had to learn how to walk again. And she's doing great. My dad fractured three ribs and, um, you know, is, is doing really well too. So they went ahead and sold their home in Atlanta and moved in with us. They've been here ever since the accident. And um, I am honored to be a part of this next short season of um, helping my mom continue to recover and, um, you know, being roommates with them. We're, we're really, Johnny and I are really enjoying it. Our kids don't live here anymore. So it's been really fun just having time, this quality time with my mom and dad, especially now that my mom's starting to feel better. And they ended up finding a house miraculously um, through a series of events here in the neighborhood, just as we had hoped for. And so we're going to be neighbors, but that won't happen until, um, you know, later in the year. So we're glad they're here with us for now, but it means I'm a little extra busy and I'm helping them organize their move from Atlanta to here. On top of all of that, in case you didn't notice, I got braces and um, I, that was not expected. That was something that I had thought about for a short time because my, my bite has been messed up. I had braces for five years when I was young and um, like probably many of you, I lost my uh, retainer. And, you know, so when you stop wearing that, everything starts moving around again. And so here we go. I'm like, I was hoping I could do something like Invisalign that I could take out, but I was not a candidate for that. So anyway, I um, ended up getting braces. It's a great diet. If you want to lose weight, just get braces because it's so hard to eat. It's hard to talk too. So anyway, um, enough about me. I, I, as always, want to speak out of the overflow of the things that God has been um, sharing with me. And I want to encourage you from the place that he has encouraged me. And uh, one of the things that I was struggling with before I went off um, for vacation for a week is just weariness. I just kept telling Johnny, he's so sweet, he would check in on my heart. How are you doing? And I just said, I just feel weary. And, um, 
you know, it's, it's a good weary cause I'm doing what I want to be doing. I don't feel like a victim or like something happened to me. Maybe you do, maybe you've gone through something that actually happened to you. Um, but I felt weary from emotionally processing, you know, what had happened to my parents, um, and weary just from being so busy. And I, the Lord had, had spoken to me in advance that this would be a time where I would have the privilege of focusing on helping my parents get moved. We didn't certainly didn't think it would happen the way that it did, but it wasn't a surprise to me that I was going to need to um, invest a lot of time. And so as I've been investing time, I just realized like I am weary on the inside and, um, I'm, I'm used to having a lot of quiet time, especially since our kids don't live here anymore. We've had different ones kind of move in and out um, at different times. But most of the time I've been able to like have several hours a day of just um, uninterrupted thought, right? And when your brain is going and going and you're trying to remember the next thing and meet the next deadline, that can bring some weariness as well. So maybe you can relate to all of this in your own way. Um, if not now, then certainly in your past and sorry to say, probably in your future. And so um, I have just been reminded again of the fact, the reality that God is our source. He is the only source for anything and everything that's good, that's right, um, that we actually need. Anything that we truly need, he is the source of. And um, knowing that is one thing, accessing it is another. So I want to speak into that. And the first thing I want to do is um, quote one of my favorite scriptures, Psalm 46, 1 in the New King James Version. God is our refuge and our strength an ever-present help in trouble. And I think that just does such a good job of summarizing what it means for him to be our source, what it means for him to be your source. God is your refuge. Think of a refuge. It's where you want to just tuck your way, tuck yourself away inside of, you know, you just, you want to disappear into a refuge, a place where you can get lost in um, safety. And he is your strength. God is your strength. So I'm going to, in just a moment, highlight the opposite of strength, which is growing weary, exhausted, faint. And so we'll get to that in a second. But God is your ever-present help in trouble. Um, trouble is can be anything from like troubled waters where, you know, just they're just the the highs and lows, kind of the roller coaster part of life. Anywhere from, you know, the little things throughout the day to the bigger waves that come as a part of, you know, circumstances of life. He is in the midst of that place of trouble that we find ourselves. So it could be like troubled water. It could be like um, trouble as in like a predicament that either you or someone else has gotten you into. And um, no matter what that storm looks like for you, that, that place of trouble, he is ever present. So it speaks to that place in us that is tempted to feel alone and sometimes we're in touch with that. We can have a really strong sense of, I'm just lonely. I feel like, like where is God? Where are the people that, that need to come around me and support me? Um, where are the things that I need, the people that I need? I'm alone. And the truth is, we can't trust our feelings in those moments. We are not alone because he is ever present. And he's not just ever present sitting there like, okay, I'm with you. No, he's an ever present help in trouble. So he's not unaffected. He's not um, the news reporter who just looks at what's happening and reports it. 
um, he is the lifeguard, right? He is ever present, ever watching and quick to jump in right into the midst of your troubled waters. And, you know, it's hard to recognize him in those times. Sometimes I have to like, you know, almost go to the, the extreme to see him, meaning I have to think, okay, this is horrible. Like, could it get any worse than this? Well, yeah. And so if he wasn't here as a help, fully present with me, it would be a lot worse. And so sometimes just recognizing that and and getting your eyes off of how bad it is, kind of switch gears and say, well, here's like how it could be worse. Or here's where I've heard that it's been worse for someone else or another situation. At, at least he prevented that, right? Um, sometimes it's so bad that you're fully convinced it really couldn't be any worse. And it's hard to find, how is he actually helping me right now? And sometimes the help comes in terms of just literally holding you together, keeping you from just absolutely quitting, you know, and there are ways to quit. And so he is your strength, your refuge, your ever-present help in trouble. All right, let's focus for a second on what um, the definition of weary is or faint or exhausted because um, we're going to get into Isaiah chapter 40, that familiar scripture, um, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. So the definition of um, weary is actually faint, and the definition of faint is actually weary, but we'll get into a little more nuance of that. So, you know, faint can mean a couple of different things. One, um, the most obvious is to lose consciousness. And the reason why a person faints and loses consciousness is because their um, blood is not getting to their brain and um, all kinds of reasons for that, right? But the idea is that that um, that normal flow is not happening and it causes you to go unconscious. So when we disconnect from our source and that flow between him and us and him and us um, is not happening, then we grow faint, unconscious, meaning we're not conscious, we're not aware of the things that we normally are. We almost get numb. And, um, you know, when you lose your awareness, your consciousness, you're disconnected from your purpose because in order to fulfill your kingdom purpose, um, which ultimately is to find a unique way to express the love of God to someone beside yourself. I mean, that's just as simple as a person's purpose can be. But within that, it can look like a business. It can look like a government position. It can look like being a parent. It can look like, um, you know, serving someone else in all the ways that we serve in our, in society. And so when you are faint, you're disconnected from your purpose. Um, another definition of faint is um, like, let's say you drew a picture, but the lines on the picture of the drawing are very faint. They're hard to see. They're difficult to detect. They're hard to notice. And again, that speaks to us being disconnected from our purpose, because if you are making a faint impression, you're not having impact. You're not making a difference. You're not, you're not doing something that is noteworthy because it's so faint, right? And so, again, these speak to um, our disconnection from our source, which is also a disconnection from our purpose. So, unfortunately, you probably hear um, right below me on our street, they are blowing the um, cut grass. <laughs> so, sorry for the noise. I'm, again, I'm not in our studio, so that is um, one of the 
downsides of it. Anyway, okay. So when we talk about um, weariness, one of the definitions that I found was when you run out of or you are exhausted of patience, tolerance, or pleasure. So I've lost my patience, I've lost tolerance, and I cannot experience pleasure because I am in survival mode. I am, um, you know, when you lose pleasure, when you're unable to experience pleasure, you're numb. You're just, um, you know, I think of people, especially people that are disconnected, like in a serious way from the Lord, like they do not have a relationship with God through Jesus. They're on a constant hunt for pleasure and they can't, nothing seems to actually fill that void because um, you're not connected to the source. So we read that verse again in a different light now. So they that wait upon the Lord, staying connected to their source, right? They will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. How do eagles mount up? They they soar up above it all. They're a, they look at storms and they see storms as an opportunity to, to glide in the rarefied air that they were created to soar in. Um, they will run and not be weary. So you're not going to run out of patience. You're not going to run out of tolerance. You're going to be able to experience pleasure when you are running because you're connected to your source. And when you walk, you will not faint. You won't lose the impact, that purpose that you were created to have. And, you know, I will, I look back honestly over the last six weeks of, um, you know, this big change that I'm mentioning related to my parents. And that that's on top of my, our daughters still really need us a lot. And I'm so honored to like invest in them. And then, you know, I'm pretty much running um, Restore 7 um, alongside of our adult, several of our adult children who I help um, encourage and direct and all of that. So, there's a lot on my plate is my, my point, but I will say that throughout the last six weeks, I have felt so connected to my purpose. Um, I've not gotten to film as much. So it's not about, you know, a ministry outlet. It's, it's about like knowing that I'm doing something that requires me to access something from God that someone else is going to benefit from. You know, a level of patience, a level of tolerance, um, and to make the impression, to actually make a difference in someone else's life and to encourage them to help in practical ways. Um, that's more fulfilling to me than, than even the opportunity to share like revelation with you guys. And that, that is that's something that I love doing, and I'm honored to do that with you guys. But but the hands-on, real-life, day-to-day, getting in the trenches with someone else and having enough overflow because you are connected to the source is so fulfilling. That is, to me, that really is the ultimate pleasure because it, it connects you to the, the destiny that God had for you when he first dreamed of you. And, and like every cell in our body and every organ in our body, our purpose is to serve the rest of the body. You can't disconnect who you are and, and what you do, not only not from the source that gives you life, but it's, it's the life that flows through you to the rest of the body to society even itself. And so when you're connected to your purpose and you have a connection to your source, the father and his, his love and his solutions are flowing through you in real tangible ways, there is so much fulfillment. All right, um, an exam- I'm gonna give you a great example of that in just a moment, but first I just wanna read to you part of Isaiah 40. And I'm starting with verse nine. And this is in um, the Passion Translation. It's, uh, you know, he has, um, Brian, is it Brian Simmons? Yes. Has all of the um, 
the books individual like books and it's kind of nice so if you want to like just focus on one book of the bible then you can just purchase one of them and versus like the whole this is the um psalms and all the new testament i think he's slowly doing the old testament so isaiah is on its own here all right um verse 9 isaiah 40 go up on a high mountain you joyful messengers of zion and lift up your voices with power you who proclaim joyous news to jerusalem shout it out and don't be afraid say to the cities of judah here is your god look here comes lord yahweh as a victorious warrior he triumphs with his awesome power watch as he brings with him his reward and the spoils of victory to give to his people. He will care for you as a shepherd tends his flock, gathering the weak lambs and taking them in his arms. He carries them close to his heart and gently leads those that have young. All right, I'll go into the next verse in just a moment. Just want to point out a few things here. Go up on a high mountain. Again, this connects to your um, purpose in life. What is the mountain in any given day that you're called to impact. And it might shift and change around, especially on the lower levels, I would say, of the mountain. So like every day I'm impacting the lower levels of family mountain, meaning my family. Um, but hey, come on in. He doesn't know I'm filming right now. <laughs> Did you just get done with... Um... I can get out of the way. <laughs> Did you just get done with the lighter strings? Yeah, I did. Okay. I'm actually filming Choose Love. I decided not to wait for the studio. So say okay. say hi to the people on well, Choose Love. Well, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> more Lord more Lord for my wife. This is special, I'm sure. Okay. I'll, I'll be down in just a little bit. Um, okay, so go up on a high mountain, you joyful messenger. So your mountain is the area of culture that you're called to impact. So on the lower levels, you know, I'm dealing with, a level of um, business because we're, you know, we are a nonprofit um, dealing with my family. And so the higher levels would be like if I was specifically called to the mountain of family, let's say I'm a psychologist or a doctor or something in, in that arena. Um, so whatever level on the mountain you're at, go up to the high place of that mountain and with a joyful, joyful voice, it says, lift up your voices with power. You have authority. You have power to impact, not faintly, but, but in an impressive way, the area of culture that you're interacting with day to day, all of the areas. Um, and then he goes on to say, you know, in the same voice, he's saying, you know, use your voice. But he's also saying he has the victory. He has triumphed with his awesome power. So you're not, this is not dependent on you. You can impact the area of culture that you're called to. You can fulfill your purpose without the weight of the world on your shoulders because God already did it. Jesus already fulfilled it. He's already victorious. It's rigged in our favor. And so the impact that you're having is, is basically you fulfilling the destiny that you were created for because God knew that you would want a part. You would want a piece of the action for all of eternity to be able to say, I carried my kingdom torch for the days that I was called to on earth because he's worthy, all because he's worthy. And he knows we're going to be standing before him face to face wishing, hoping, grateful that we had any kind of opportunity on this side of heaven to do something that honored him and his kingdom. So yes, it's urgent. We have to bring change to the world, but it's rigged. We're already going to win because he already won. So we can go about our purpose without the weight of the bigger picture on us. Um, so he triumphs. And then He's also saying like his spoils of victory are coming to his people. You know, whether we see it in our lifetime or the next generation sees it in their lifetime or we have a measure of it and they have a greater measure of it. There, he has shared with us and will continue to the spoils of victory. 
as abundance comes your way in whatever form it looks like, an abundance of joy or an abundance of financing or whatever it is, um, it's the spoils of his victory that you are receiving and a conduit of. And then he says, out of, kind of out of the clear blue, I, I mean, it's almost not even in the same theme. He says, he will care for you as a shepherd tends his flock, gathering the weak lambs, taking them in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. And he gently leads those that have young. Wow. That, that so ministers to me because one of the things that keeps us from accessing all that he is as our source, you know, strength and the different nuances of strength that we need day to day, strength of finances or strength of peace of mind, literal strength, because we're just physically exhausted. Whatever it is, it comes in a position of we're weak lambs and it's okay that we're weak. We can be honest about the fact that we're weak. And we're gonna talk about Solomon in just a moment and how Solomon was honest about his weakness and where that landed him as it relates to his source. Okay, so um, we're weak lambs. He takes us in his arms. And then, I don't know about you, but if you're around my age then and, and younger and you have kids or kids that you care about, even if they're not your own kids, they are what is heaviest on your heart and on your mind right now. Um, and then you get grandkids and then you, you're that you carry them in your heart too. Right. And so he's, he's in the same breath. He's saying, I got this rigged. It's already one. You have a part, use your voice, but I know that you're weak. You're my weak little lamb and I'm carrying you and I'm going to gently lead you those of you that have young. So imagine a shepherd with his sheep and, you know, he's get, he's moving them. He's moving them on to places of where they need food, where they need shelter, where they have safety. And sometimes he probably has to drive them quickly more than they want to be driven, right? It's come on, let's move it. Let's move it. But he gently leads those with young. So those those mama ewes, is that what they call them? Ewes, E-W-E-S, ewes. Um, they, they have little ones. They're, they're going to change their pace when they have a little one that is counting on them. And I don't know about you, but my thoughts, even with my adult um, children, adult kids, I don't know what to call them. They're adults, but they were my kids. <laughs> um I, you know, I think about each one of them, even my son-in-laws, I, I think about each one of them. And I, I, there's a part of me that I don't want to move so fast in the things of the Lord that I forget, you know, where each one of them are at and how can I encourage them in, in the place where they are with the Lord, um, and God's aware of that. That's the whole point with this is that he is a shepherd that is aware that we're bringing people that we're responsible for with us. And so he gently leads us. It's it's just beautiful. Anyway, okay, the next verse, I'm gonna read the rest of this chapter. Uh, this section is called the infinite God. I love that. Okay, now this is just gonna reconnect us to how capable and comprehensive our source is. He is our source. The one I'm about to describe is your personal source for everything you need, everything you could possibly need on this side of heaven. Who has measured the waters of the sea in the hollow of his hand and used his hand width to mark off the heavens? Who knows the exact weight of all the dust of the earth and has weighed all the mountains and hills on his scale. Who fully understands the spirit of Yahweh or is wise enough to counsel him? Whom does he consult to be enlightened? Who teaches him the ways of justice? Who imparts knowledge to him? Or shows him the true path of wisdom? <laughs> I mean, those are obviously rhetorical questions. He's it. 
He's the source. He's the, the, if you follow anything that's good, anything that is true, anything that is perfect, anything that is accurate, anything that is beautiful or just anything good, it all goes all the way back, all the way back, all the way back to him. And there's nothing beyond him. He is the source of it all. Even the nations are to him like a drop in a bucket, regarded as nothing more than dust on a scale. Meaning they don't even, they don't even affect the scale. He picks up the islands like fine grains of sand. All of Lebanon's trees are not enough firewood for him nor are all its animals enough for a burnt offering. The nations are nothing in his eyes. He regards them as absolutely nothing. Who even comes close to being compared to God? How could you ever compare God to an idol? A craftsman forms an idol God, then a goldsmith overlays it with gold and forges its silver chains The one who is poor and cannot afford silver or gold to make an idol, they choose a tree that will not rot, then seek a skilled workman to make an idol that will not topple. This is the silliness of comparing anything we could come up with to worship besides him. This next section is called Fear Not. Don't you realize that God is the creator or source? Don't you hear the truth? Haven't you been told this from the beginning? Haven't you understood this since he laid a firm foundation for the earth? He sits enthroned high above the circle of the earth. To him, the people of earth are like grasshoppers. I'm just glad it's grasshopper instead of an ant. (laughs) Uh, He stretches out the heavens like a curtain, spreading it open like a tent to live in. He reduces rulers to nothing and makes the elite of the earth as nothing at all. They barely get planted and barely take root in their positions of power when the Lord blows on them and they wither away, carried off like straw in the stormy wind. And this last section is called God Above All Others. The Holy One asks Can you find anyone or anything to compare to me? Where is the one equal to me? Let him just ask your heart that question right now. That thing in us that gets so frantic and panics because we just need something to, to connect to so that we have some kind of overflow, some kind of resource for everything that we feel like we're lacking. And he's saying, is there, is there anything else? Cause, cause I'm it. The implication here is I'm it. I'm your source. I'm the only one. Lift up your eyes to the sky and see for yourself. Who do you think created the cosmos? He lit every shining star and formed every glowing galaxy and stationed them all where they belong. He has numbered, counted, and given everyone a name. That's unbelievable. They shine because of God's incredible power and awesome might. Not one fails to appear. Why then, O Jacob's tribes, would you ever complain? And my chosen Israel, why would you say Yahweh isn't paying attention to my situation? He has lost all interest in what happens to me. He's speaking to the lie that we all are tempted to believe. Why aren't you paying attention to me and my situation? Have you lost interest in what happens to me? And he's saying, don't you know? Haven't you been listening? Yahweh is the one and only everlasting God, the creator of all you can see and imagine. He never gets weary or worn out. His intelligence is unlimited. He's never puzzled over what to do. He empowers the feeble and infuses the powerless with increasing strength. The um, verse in the 
King James version that you would be more familiar with says, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. He gives strength to the weary, to those that feel faint, that are disconnected from their purpose because they're just in survival mode. They don't have enough for themselves. There's lack there, so there's nothing to overflow to, to have to give to your purpose and your destiny. He gives strength to you. The one we've been reading about here, the mighty one who created everything, who's the source of all these things, is your source, is my source. He is available. He's, he's our ever-present help in our trouble. That's the one who you have access to, who I have access to. Goes on to say, even young people faint and get exhausted. Athletic ones may stumble and fall. But those who entwine their hearts with Yahweh will experience divine strength. They will rise up on soaring wings and fly like eagles, run their race without growing weary, and walk through life without giving up. So again, um, that's the verse in the New King James that says, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. This is a promise over us. It's a personal promise to every single one of you. And um, I want to use Solomon as an example of what we've been talking about. And then I want to pray for you. Um, Solomon, what's he known for? He was... King David's son, who became king after him, king of Israel, and he was the wisest man to have ever lived, supposedly. You know what? I wonder if I ask Siri what she'll say. This is just a random thought. I don't even know what she's going to say. Who is the wisest man that has ever lived? From crossway dot or though King Solomon is widely recognized throughout history as the wisest man that ever lived. King Solomon, even Siri agrees, right? <laughs> All right, so Solomon, um, I was refreshing myself on what happened. He was actually worshiping, um, burning incense, not to the one God. And he had gone away to a place called Gibeon to do that, if I understood that verse correctly. And he lay down to sleep that night after, you know, burning incense to false idol and God met him in a dream and God appeared to him in a dream and asked him a question. And he said, I will give you whatever you want. Kind of like the genie in the bottle question, you know, what's your one, your one wish. And his one wish, first of all, immediately he got in touch with, okay, this is how you, act. we can know all day long. God is my source and he's incredible and awesome. And I need to access him. But what, how do we position our hearts in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the battles, in the midst of survival mode? How do we position our hearts to actually access him as our source? This is what Solomon did. First of all, he recognized his true reality. And he said, God, I am like a little child. I'm a little boy. I mean, this is a man who people you know, catered to his every whim. Anything he asked for, it was done. He could have someone killed like that. And he easily connected to who he really was before God. I am a child. And he said, I don't have a clue what to do with the people that need me. And he didn't say it, but in, in my perspective, he was recognizing the ones that God loves. He was called to be a king, to serve, to rightly judge the people of God, the ones that were the most um, loved, beloved by God. They were his chosen people at the time. Evidently, the rest of the world was in a lot of chaos and people were, you know, running with false narratives of who God was. And these were the ones that had set their lives apart to follow the one true God. So God had a vested interest in the people that Solomon was king over. And so 
Solomon was, God was moved by Solomon's heart for the people that God loved. So that's the first way that you access God as the source for whatever you're needing in any given moment is immediately, instead of going inward, you know, the inward part is I don't have what it takes. I am but a child. I don't have an overflow right now. Okay. That's, that's the humility to, to ass properly assess yourself before the Lord. I am weak. I am needy. I do need you to provide whatever it is that you're needing. The way he accessed it was to connect the need to the ones that God loved. So looking for where is your outlet? Where are you called to, if, if, if God is your source and you're asking him for something, let's say I'm asking him for um, finances or I'm asking him for peace or I'm asking him for, you know, love. Um, this is a source who gives over and above. That's just who God is. God doesn't ever, ever, ever give just enough. That's just not who he is. He always gives an overflow. And so when we go ahead and define where our overflow is going to go related to that need, you have officially accessed the source of what you need. Capital S, our father. Um, sometimes we wonder, you know, I'm asking, I'm asking, I'm telling him I need more of this. And he's not seeming to respond. Check and see if it's because you haven't yet connected to where the overflow of what you're asking for will need to go. Right? So Solomon did that. He tapped into a major vein of resources. Not only is Solomon known for wisdom, he's known for the incredible riches. He was the wealthiest man that had ever lived and some say probably has ever lived. Um, he tapped into a major vein of resources because Solomon wanted it for the purpose of helping God's people. He said, I'm but a child. I need you to give me wisdom to know how to discern and rightly judge these people that you have given me to serve. And God immediately responds in the dream and he says, not only will I give you wisdom and make you the most wisest man who's ever lived, I am, because you did not ask for something for yourself, again, he was connected to where the overflow was going to go. I'm going to give you what you didn't even ask for. I'm going to give you riches. I'm going to give you fame. I'm going to give you favor. I'm going to give you honor. And, um, and the most important thing that he gave him was the wisdom because that directly affected those that God loved. So asking towards an overflow, where are you going to be a conduit to with what you're asking for, what you're needing to access him as your source? And then secondly, so the first thing is the posture of your heart identifying you are weak and you are in need. Secondly, identifying where your um, overflow is going to go to because you're expecting him to provide what you're actually asking him to be the source of. And he's going to give abundantly of whatever that is. So where's the overflow going to go? Identify that. And then thirdly, lastly, identify. Um, uh, what was the third one? Identify the purpose for helping the people. So he knew he got wisdom. Now, how was he going to actually walk that out with the people around him? And he was given so much that he had to steward way more than he even asked for. So the third component is, is all about stewarding the overflow that you're given. So I came back just practically um, really refreshed from being at the beach. And, you know, so the question becomes, how do I steward that? Like you, you just gave me an overflow and, and just, I feel very spoiled, you know, having had 
seven days to just look at the ocean. Um, and so what, what do I, how do I steward where you have given me that overflow? And he's, you know, made it clear to me where, where I'm going to steward that. And, um, and I'm, I'm doing it with his help. So, um, that is the main thing that I wanted to cover today. And I would love an opportunity to just pray over you right now. So wherever you are, if you want to just, um, you know, close your eyes and just receive from him the source. So, Father, we just still ourselves on the inside right now in the midst of troubled waters, whatever that looks like for the person that is watching or listening right now. Um, my brothers and my sisters, I just speak stillness on the inside. That place that um, that is starving, that is lacking something that the Father is longing and happy to give you. Peace, be still. And we just look at you right now, our source, our, our amazing, awesome, victorious God. The one who is, um, who gladly overflows with all that we need. We just run into you, our strength, our refuge, our ever-present help. And we just sit in this place of being your children, your sons, your daughters, who, like Solomon, we just say, we don't, we're not able to be a source for ourselves. We are weak. We are weary. We are faint. We are lacking the impact we know we were created to have, our purpose, our destiny. We're, we're exhausted, many physically, many mentally, emotionally, even spiritually exhausted. And so we know that, that that not only doesn't turn you off or turn you away, but you are drawn to our weakness. And so we, um, like a child, just expose our weakness to you knowing that you've already seen it and you already have a way um, out, a way of refueling us. And so we look to you as our beautiful, awesome source. You are the creator. You are the source of all good, perfect um, things. You are the source of truth and wisdom. You are the source of peace and joy and all of the fruit of the spirit. You are the source of it all. There is nothing that we need that doesn't come from and live in abundance within you. So we lean happily into you. We lean our, our weakness, our weariness into you. And thank you for being our strength. We worship you. We worship you, beautiful God. We honor you. Thank you for the privilege of needing your strength. We ask that your strength would just um, overflow into every person, every single person, God. You know the areas of weakness. You know the practical places, the emotional places, the spiritual places, the mental fatigue. You understand it all. So we just, by an act of faith, we receive your strength into all those places in us right now, God. And, and we ask that you would show each one of us, I ask for my brothers and my sisters, would you just show each one of them a place of overflow where they can be a conduit to the things that they are lacking right now. You wanna give to them abundantly so that they have more than enough for themselves and others around them. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just make those, those overflow areas very clear to them. And in that place of accessing you as source and as strength, um, that they would truly be a conduit for the overflow that you give to them. And we thank you. We worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Amen, Bonnie. How's it going over there? Radio. <laughs>
All right. They didn't bother us. Um, well, love you guys. And I will be seeing you a little more consistently now because um, I'm back in the saddle here and I'm just going to give myself permission wherever I'm at to do this even a little more informally than in the studio. So um, have a great rest of your day or evening and I'll see you back on the next Choose Love.